Do you guys ever get distracted? I, I mean, I, I personally don't ever get distracted, but um, you ever find yourself getting off track or, or heading down rabbit trails, trying to figure out where your train of thought had originally been? Have you, here's one, <clears throat> have you ever woken up from a Facebook feed coma, trying to figure out where you're at, how long you've been on, and, and how, how your finger is so tired from scrolling and scrolling and scrolling? Do you guys ever, I did this the other day, uh, Griffin and I were running errands, and I, I was pulling back into our neighborhood, and he's like, Dad, we're, we're not done with errands yet. And I was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? I was focused on something else and ended up just kind of doing that habit thing where you, you zone out and you're thinking about one thing and you get distracted and you end up where you didn't really mean to go. It's, it's pretty easy to get distracted these days, isn't it? Uh, according, and, and I find this just really interesting. According to a 2018 study, the average American worker experiences 56 different distractions during their workday. Everything from a chime of a new email to a phone call to a coworker stopping by your, your desk to drop something off or chat about something random or checking in on social media or a text message buzzing in your pocket, there are constant distractions for the average American worker. Uh, the study found that on average, American workers spend only three minutes, three minutes on focused work before they switch tasks and do something else, which then causes them to spend additional time refocusing on this new task to then work an average of three minutes on that and then get pulled into another direction and have to refocus and spend a couple of minutes on work. It's, it's fascinating. It adds up to not distractions in total, but just the amount of time in trying to refocus. Two hours every workday for your average American is wasted on random distractions that broke focused work. Do, do you guys ever get distracted? It's pretty easy to get distracted these days. But would it make you feel any better if I told you that people have been getting distracted for thousands and thousands of years? In his opening paragraphs to his letter to Timothy, the Apostle Paul, he, he addresses this issue of distraction almost 2,000 years ago. So, so you don't have to feel too bad about being distracted. It has been happening forever. Tonight we're going to start a walkthrough of this letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. But before we get in there, uh, I want to set the scene for you to kind of give you an idea of what was going on in the world when Paul was writing this letter to Timothy? What, what the baseline of the things that were going on in that area of the world? What had happened was, um, after Jesus' death and resurrection, this movement called the Way began to kick up in Jerusalem. And, and there was this man who was a passionate zealot who decided that it was going to be his life goal to stamp out these heretics. And, and he was going to be the tip of the spear that would hunt them down wherever they were found. He would bring them to justice and, and even be willing to execute them if needed. And, and on his way to find a, a hive of these heretics... The man that we now know as the Apostle Paul has a come-to-Jesus moment where everything is changed. His life is completely transformed. And instead of being the tip of the spear that was going to wipe out this heresy, he ends up being one of the most prominent men to take the gospel of Jesus all over the known world. And as he travels the Roman world, setting up these little colonies of new believers with this gospel, this good news, that, that would be changing lives, individual lives and then family lives and then entire communities. He, he would teach them how to create these little, these little ecclesias, these little churches that we call them. 
but, but really they were just small communities of believers in these, these towns, these cities all, all over the place. And they would meet together and they would worship together. And oftentimes when we think about the early church, right, that, that first section, the first 100, 200, 300 years of the early church, we often think of the churches in America, the churches that we grow up with, the buildings and, and bands and, and nurseries and children's check-in and coffee and, and all of the stuff that we do, pulpits. But none of the people in the early church, if they showed up to our church or, or pretty much any church in modern America, would have any idea that it was a church. It would look so completely different to them. These people were actually far closer to our community groups. Just small little groups of people that would meet together in, in, in houses or in stables or on rooftops. And they would eat together and they would pray together and they would laugh together and they would serve each other and serve their community and they would live life together. And they would hold each other accountable to the teachings of Jesus. And, and they were these little community groups. And, and it's fascinating because Paul goes around and, and it, the scripture tells us that he plants these little churches all over the place. But really, what he really was doing is he was, he was starting community groups. He, he was kicking off these tiny little bands of people that would begin to grow and grow. This is what Acts 2.42, this is how... The, the very beginning of the book of Acts describes these groups of people and kind of what they did and what you could expect from them. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. That's what they did. That was the early church. And if you were to show up, it would look a lot like a Tuesday night or a Thursday night with an Oasis community group and not so much like a, a Sunday night. But that's what our community groups are modeled after, the, the example of this early church. And it's in these groups that these believers w would have true, lasting life change take place. And, and, and so when, when I tell you during announcement times that our community groups are kicking up at the end of this month, it, it's not that it's one more thing that I need to announce. It's something that we need to have something on the calendar to go. It's, it's because I truly believe and I have experienced, and those of you that have been in community groups know the reality of this, that being in fellowship with believers, with people who have children that get to play with your children, people that will pray with you about what's going on at work, who will come around you at the loss of a loved one, who will make you meals when you have surgery, these are the people that make church what it is. And this is what the early church was doing. And so as these ancient community groups started popping up all over the Roman world, in these non-Jewish, totally pagan cities and, and cultures and communities all over the place, there were questions that were beginning to get raised, especially back at home base in Jerusalem, by the Jewish believers who, who had all of these questions like, what, what do we do with these people? How, how is this going to work? Because they're, the, they're not Jewish. They don't know our stuff. They don't know our culture. They don't know our, our history or our religion. All of these things began to pop up in their minds. And, and they revolved around this single question that would be answered by the Council of Jerusalem. And the single question is this, do you have to become Jewish before you can follow Jesus? And so in Acts 15, we see the, the council of Jerusalem that takes all of these little questions and all the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, they begin to debate this and they have dialogue around this and there's, there's people on both sides of this issue and it is a passionate debate. And I'm not going to go through it tonight, um, but, but let me tell you, it is worth your time. It's worth your time to read this because this is a huge defining moment for Christianity. The, the answer to this question that these men come up with shifts the entire trajectory of what would become Christianity. Everything from this point hinges in a totally different direction than what it was going. 
But for now, the, the, let me just tell you, the gist of the question is, do you have to become Jewish in order to follow Jesus? And the answer that they come up with is no. No, you don't. It, it's summed up by James, the brother of Jesus, in this way. This is what he says. This is Acts 15, 19. He says, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. All of the stuff that we have grown up with, everything that we've known, all that we've been taught our entire lives is incredibly important to us. But for those that grow up outside, those that grow up and have no idea of what God has been doing in, in the history of our people, we do not want to have to burden them in order for them to receive salvation. And so, you don't have to be Jewish to follow Jesus. And for us, this seems like a no-brainer. We've grown up 2,000 years removed, and it's like, well, yeah, I mean, of course. But for the followers of Jesus in this first century, this was incredibly important. And so Paul leaves the council of Jerusalem and he heads out to tell all of these different little ancient community groups that he's set up all over the Roman world the news about what's happened. And so he goes from church to church to church telling them and filling them in on all of this stuff that's going on. And, and while he's traveling around, he, he arrives at this city called Lystra. And in Lystra, he meets this family. There is a, a Greek father who's not a believer, and his wife is a believer, and her mother is a believer. Okay? They have a son who is apparently a super special guy. There, there is something in this, in this guy, and we don't know exactly how old he is when, when Paul first meets him, but there's something special about him that Paul sees and recognizes that, that this guy has been gifted and could be used as a huge asset to the kingdom of God. And so Paul takes with him Timothy. And these two form an incredibly tight bond, this incredibly tight uh, friendship. And they travel together and Paul ministers to him and they do ministry together for a long time. And, and Timothy ends up traveling with, uh, with Luke and when, uh, when Rome comes in and quells this rebellion in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem just gets hammered by the Romans in 70 AD, it is John, the last surviving apostle, that moves from the epicenter of Christianity in Jerusalem when, when Rome just hammers the city. He moves to Ephesus to live with Timothy and this church that Paul is going to put Timothy in charge of. And, and so... Um, Timothy is this incredibly important man. The, the, the relationship between him and Paul becomes foundational to what Christianity would end up becoming in the first hundred years. And, and so when Paul is, is going around and he's hearing about all these things that are happening in these different little communities that he has set up over the years, when he begins to hear of some stuff that's going on in this church in Ephesus, this church that he spent years with and loves these people, he hears rumors of some things that need taken care of in this church. And so he sends his right-hand man, Timothy, to Ephesus. And Timothy is the guy that is sent in to help this young group of believers as they try and figure out what it means to follow Jesus. And so Timothy gets dropped off in Ephesus and Paul continues northward and writes this letter back to Timothy, giving him some instruction and the people in Ephesus some ideas of what's going on. So, that's a little bit of background into 1 Timothy. So, if you'll open your Bibles with me to the book of Timothy, you're going to find it in the New Testament. And 1 Timothy is right smack dab in the middle of all the other T books in the New Testament. So you've got 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, if you still use a paper Bible. If you don't, just, you know, type it in, it'll pop up. It's pretty great. So I'm going to read to you out of Paul's opening thoughts to his letter to Timothy. I'm going to start in chapter 1, verse 3. Here's what the Apostle Paul tells to Timothy as he's going into this church. As I urged you when I went to Macedonia... 
remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach false doctrine or to pay attention to myths or endless genealogies. These promote empty speculations rather than God's plan, which operates by faith. Now, the goal of our instruction is to, it is love. And that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and turned aside to fruitless discussions. They want to be teachers of the law, although they don't understand what they're saying or what they're insisting on. But we know that the law is good, provided one uses it legitimately. We know that the law is not meant for righteous persons, but for the lawless and the rebellious, for the ungodly and the sinful, for the unholy and the irreverent, for those who kill mothers and fathers, for murderers, for sexually immoral, for the homosexuals, for slave traders, for liars, for perjurers, for whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God which was entrusted to me. So, a lot going on here. A couple of things that pop out to me. The first thing that pops out to me is the issues that Paul sends Timothy in to deal with in this church, right? This is a, a young church, relatively, and Paul has some very specific things that he wants Timothy to address while he's there. I want you to address the bad doctrine and the teachers that are spending their time focused on myths and endless genealogies. Well, what does that even mean? Myths and genealogies. This community is not located in Israel. They are located up north, and they are not Jewish. And so when Paul comes to them, and he begins to tell them about Jesus, they have no reference of what Judaism is. They don't know the history, they don't know the culture, they don't know any of the religious practices or the festivals or events or any of this stuff. And so when Paul comes in and explains the gospel of Jesus, they have this natural curiosity. They, they want to dig into, man, okay, so if Jesus was Jewish, we probably need to know and understand this stuff, right? And so they try, and they're trying to learn as much as they possibly can, which is helpful, right? It, it is very helpful. But the problem seems to arise when they get off on these rabbit trails. When they, they search for all of this knowledge and all of this understanding, and they begin to forget the core principles, the core focus of the gospel. And they end up spending their time on this stuff that is just meaningless, and, and it is pointless, and they get into all these discussions and all of these debates and all of these arguments about genealogies and myths and all of these things, then they go down in these tiny little rabbit holes that are interesting, I guess, but in doing so, they get so distracted by that little stuff that they forget the big picture. Big picture. They get mired in, in, the, in the muck, in, in the minutia. They end up getting stuck on the, the things that really weren't the point. You ever still find yourself doing stuff like that? You're looking around at your life and, and wondering, is this it? Like, like, is this all that there is for me to do? I'm, I'm working and my, I'm doing my stuff, but it's just, it, it's this grind. And you look around on what's happening on the news and you read in the newspaper, if you still get the newspaper, you look on social media and you see all of these little debates and all of this stuff that ends up being speculation and, and you know, comments and all, all of these things. And it just seemed pointless. Do, do you ever notice that? Have you ever seen anybody change their mind in any sort of Facebook comment thread? But honestly, have you ever seen anybody change their mind in a comment thread? I, I would love to know that. Don and I go back and forth all the time. Hasn't happened yet, but I'm, I'm going to get you. See what I mean? <laughs> this is where the Ephesian church is at when Timothy arrives. They're fascinated with these, these little things, this little minutia that they find so interesting. And man, if we could just figure all this stuff out, all of our problems will be solved. And they start off with these great intentions. If we just knew a little bit more, 
If we just, if we just dive a little bit deeper into the nuance, spend a little bit more time gaining a little bit more knowledge. They, they have this deep desire to know and understand, but, but it's not long until their search for knowledge leads them into really weird ideas. And, and this hamster wheel that you can spend a million miles an hour and get absolutely nowhere. They, they become totally fruitless in their walk with Christ. Which is why Paul's next sentence, after he gets done describing, here's what I want you to tackle. His next sentence reminds Timothy and the Ephesian church, what is at stake? What is the point? What is the whole thing that we're trying to do? Here's where you're focused. Let me remind you where you should be focused. Verse five. Now the goal of our instruction is Love. The goal of our instruction is love. Is that getting old yet? Are you getting tired of me telling you this over and over and over again? Every week, I feel like I'm using the word love constantly. It is a constant refrain when you read through Paul's letters. No matter what you're reading, where you're going, you're going to see Paul say the same thing over and over. Galatians 5, 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is faith working through love. All of that stuff that we thought was super important, all of those things that were absolutely critical, does not matter. Here's what matters. Your faith working itself out through love. If you're not doing that, you're missing the point. 1 Corinthians 13, if you've ever been to a wedding, if you've ever been to a Christian Protestant wedding, you have probably heard something out of 1 Corinthians 13. The entire chapter is called the love chapter. I'm guessing at your wedding, somebody read something out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Here's what Paul says to the Corinthians church. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but I do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not love, I am nothing. If I give all of my possessions to the poor, if I give over my body to hardship, then I boast. Do you get this constant refrain from Paul? It all focuses on this single idea. He, he ends up ending this chapter with 1 Corinthians 13.13, 13, which probably was read at your wedding. Some of you might have it on a wall somewhere. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is Love. Paul didn't make this stuff up on his own. He, he didn't just come up with this because he was really interested in this newfangled, hippie, psychedelic guru stuff. This came straight from Jesus. This is what Jesus talked about constantly. Talked about this last week. John 13, 34, and 35, right? The new command that Jesus gives to his disciples is what? Love one another. I know, it's a broken record, I'm telling you. It is constantly, constantly spoken of in Scripture. All the time. Everywhere you read, all of the things. And so you, you read these guys, you read the letters, letters of Paul, you read the Gospels, and it's like, okay, come on, guys, give me something else. G give me something different. Give me a better way to love. Give me a little bit more meat on those bones. Love's great, but come on, like, give me something. How do I do this better? Turns out Paul actually finishes verse 5 in 1 Timothy by breaking this one thing down. He takes the one thing that is the big deal of the gospel. And he breaks it down into three practical parts. Here's what he says. Now the goal of our instructions is love. 
that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Those three things will bring you closer to this one big thing. Okay. So a, a pure heart. How do you get a pure heart? Is that something you can just conjure up in the morning when you, when you wake up before you head off to work? A pure heart. A pure heart comes only from a single source. It can only happen in one way and there is nothing that you can do to achieve it. It only comes from God. It's the only place you can get it. It, it, is, it is the purity of someone's heart that has been washed clean, purified from all of the garbage, all of the mistakes, all of the regrets, all of the stuff that we deal with constantly in life. Scripture calls it sin. No amount of money, no amount of apologies, no amount of good works, no amount of begging can get you a pure heart. There is nothing that you can do to earn it, to create it. It's not on you. If you want to know how to love, you must start here. To truly live a, love, a life of love like Jesus, this is where it starts, a, a pure heart, a heart that has been washed clean by the, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. That is the work of him and him alone. There's nothing you can do to earn that, nothing you can do to create that. So the second thing, the good conscience, a good conscience, that, that little voice in the back of your head reminding you of, of who you are, of what you've done, what you should be doing. How do you get a good conscience? This is what I believe is our part in the story. God is the one that grants and produces and washes clean a pure heart. But our responsibility comes here on this second one. And this comes from the practical partnering with God in living out love in real hands-on action ways. This is the, re the result of continually putting your faith to work. Taking that thing that you believe in, that you think of, that's inside and doing something about it. It is the daily habit of waking up and asking God to use you to bring heaven to earth. It doesn't happen just willy-nilly. If you're just coasting through life, this is not something that you will have. It is what happens when you wake up and you decide, I need to go start reading with those second graders at the school down the street. It's what happens when you put your love and your faith to work when somebody needs a hide-a-bed moved. And you're sore anyway, right, Don? But you man up and you put your faith in action and you own it. And you do that habitually, over and over and over, constantly working your faith out in practical ways. So what happens when you show up to work, even though you would rather be anywhere else on the planet, and you say as you walk in those doors, God, I do not want to be here, but will you use me anyway? Will you show me a way to love and to serve my boss that I can't stand? Will you figure out a way to get my thick head around this idea of loving and serving my coworkers? This isn't really an easy thing in our culture to do. To, to give of yourself for somebody else's benefit. Usually it works the other way around. But we're told that this is different. Science tells us that to form any sort of a solid habit, to, to get in the habit of doing something constantly, over and over and over again, it takes on average 66 days. 66 days of continuously successful practice. 
There was a big study done recently in, uh, I don't know, like 2011 or, or 12, and it showed that depending on what the habit is and depending on how you're wired and what kind of circumstances you're in, it'll take anywhere from 18 to 254 days to form a habit. 254 days. That's a long time. But on average, you're going to need about 66 days, just over two months to form a habit to the point where you don't have to struggle through it as much. It gets just a little bit easier. It becomes routine. It becomes something that you don't have to think about anymore. And I think this is where the, the Christian lifestyle, this idea of, of holiness, of sanctification, starts to make practical sense. When you're practicing something over and over and over to the point where it becomes second nature. You don't even have to think about it anymore. It's just one of the things you do. It's one of the things you're known for. That, I think, is a beautiful thing. But, but we've got to work at forming those spiritual habits, the, those spiritual disciplines. And it's a discipline. The third thing Paul talks about is, is a sincere faith. If you want to live a life of love, not only do you have to have a, a pure heart, not only do you have to have a good conscience, but you have to have a sincere faith. And, and for me here, the, the key word isn't necessarily faith. We all expect Paul to say we, we need faith. That's, that's a given. The people of God, it, in fact, any religion is going to tell you you've got to have faith. That, that's not a surprise. For me, the fact that Paul puts this word sincere before faith is helpful. Faith is to, is to believe in something, to, to trust in someone. Even though you can't see it, even though there isn't definitive proof, you have faith, you, you believe and you, you trust it. But what about sincere faith? I think this clarifies, at least for me. And I don't know if I'm getting way too into the minutiae and the, and the mud on this one, but, but for me, the, the idea of a real, honest, sincere faith. No, no faking, no, no pretending, no putting on a, a mask when you show up. Not having to get the disguise out of the closet because somebody's coming over, or, or yeah, we probably should go, go to community groups, so everybody put on your happy face. But a sincere honest faith. Your faith exactly where it's at with, with no filters. All of the raw emotion, all of the struggles, all of the things that are going on in life and being able to be you where you're at in your faith. This, this desire to, to be able to say, you know what, I, I don't have it all figured out. I don't have a perfect faith, God, but I want that. There's this uh, moment in the Gospel of Mark where this father comes up to Jesus and, and is asking for him to heal his son. And Jesus asks him about his faith and, and, and his, the father's response is, is I, I do believe, but will you help me to un overcome my unbelief? I think that's sincere belief. Being honest enough with yourself and with God to say, you know what? I, I, I can believe this far. You're going to have to help me with the rest of this, God. I, I don't have it all figured out, but I want to. The, the church in Ephesus was distracted. They, they got focused on the wrong stuff, and they needed somebody to come in and, and help them get back on track. And they were searching for all of these answers that were, that were really important to them, but weren't the thing. They were hoping that, that some obscure knowledge, some, some interesting oddity that they could poke around in and, 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 and find some new fact would really change them and really bring about this, this life transformation that they were hoping for. It wasn't the answer. They were looking in the, in the wrong spot. 
And so Paul, in verse 6, he starts walking them through the reality of where they're at. He says this, Some have departed from these, these three things, and turned aside to these fruitless discussions. They, they want to be teachers of the law, although they don't understand what they're saying or what they're insisting on. But we know that the law is good, provided that you use it legitimately. We know the law is not meant for the righteous person, but for the lawless, for the rebellious, for the ungodly, the sinful, for the unholy, the irreverent, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for the homosexuals, for the slave traders, for the liars, for the perjurers, for whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God which was entrusted to me. None of that stuff is fixed with knowledge. None of those things that Paul begins to list off is fixed with knowing more stuff. None of the things that eat away at your soul and eat away at our society can be fixed with just one more insight, one more piece of, of deep knowledge that's, that's dug from the depths. Paul would know. Paul would know that knowledge wasn't the answer. Because Paul was a Pharisee. He knew the law really, really well. And he was a zealot. This, you guys, this guy was passionate. Passionate to the point of violence in order to make sure that the law was adhered to. If knowledge was the cure for the human condition, Paul would have been a shining example of its power to transform a life. But the guy's life was a mess. His passion was to violently arrest and even execute people that he found to be going against what he thought was right. His deep knowledge of God, his deep knowledge of the law wasn't the answer. And so he reminds Timothy and us of his story. In 12 through 17, he goes through and he shares his testimony one more time. Timothy, let me remind you of who I was. Let me remind you of what God did in my life. I was here. I knew all of the stuff. This is what he said. I give thanks to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man. But I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance in my unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed, along with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into this world to save Sinners, not the righteous, not the wealthy, not the powerful, but sinners. And I am the worst of them. But I receive mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Because it's, it's easy to get distracted. Happens to me all the time. You should have a meeting in with me at Starbucks sometime. It's the worst. It's easy to let your focus drift. To get wrapped up in these, these little things that are entertaining or, or fascinating or whatever it is. And the more time that you spend focused on it, that this small little thing ends up getting bigger and seeming more important. And the longer that you spend on it, the more it grows and the more it sucks you in. It happens to all of us. <laughs> it happens to me all the time. And it doesn't matter if it's your job or your spouse or your kids or the flavor of politics that you enjoy or, or your sports things. We have more opportunities for distraction than at any point in the history of humanity. 
anything that you've ever wanted to know is available instantly at your fingertips for free on any subject. And we are finding out more stuff every day. If you put your, your notifications alerts on, you will get constantly inundated with new information, new stuff coming at you all the time from any area of the world, any discipline. It is, it is easier than ever to get sucked in. And, and I think it's because of that. I think it's because of this time in which we live, this culture in which we live, that it's more important than ever to focus on the one thing. The, the single thing that above all else brings us in line with the work of God in our community to bring heaven to earth. Will you stand with me as we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, will you help us this week as we walk out into this world that you've placed us in, outside of these walls and 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 outside of the fellowship with our, our friends and our fellow believers and back into work and family and drama and all the stuff that we left outside. As we walk back out into that this week, will you help us to refocus on the things that matter most to you this week? God, will you purify our hearts of everything that does not bring you glory? Will you prompt us to act in love this week? Will you help us to build this habit of service into our lives? Will you reward our honest and our sincere faith right where we're at so that we don't have to pretend, we don't have to put on some sort of disguise? Will you help us in our areas of unbelief? God, will you help us to take that next step of faith towards you this week? Amen.